The 26th of December marks St. Stephen's Day. Stephen was a Greek Jew who had converted to Christianity. He was the first Christian martyr. Listen for words of faith in the book of Acts. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he died, and Saul approved of their killing him. In response to this story of faith and the early church, let us say together the traditional collect from the Book of Common Prayer. Grant, O Lord, that in all our sufferings here upon earth, for the testament of your truth, we may steadfastly look up to heaven and by faith behold the glory that shall be revealed and being filled with the Holy Spirit may learn to love and bless our ancestors, persecutors. By the example of your first martyr, St. Stephen, who prayed for his murderers to you, O blessed Jesus, who stands at the right hand of God to succor all those that suffer for you, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. A reading from the first book of Samuel. Samuel was ministering before the Lord. A boy wearing a linen ephod. His mother used to make him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. When the priest Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, may the Lord bless you with children by this woman for the gift that she has made to the Lord. And then they would return home. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favour with the Lord and the people. For the stories of our ancestors in the faith. Listen for words of faith in the Gospel of Luke. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. Assuming he was in the group of travellers, they went a day's journey. They started to look for him among their relatives and friends. 
When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. For stories of Jesus with his family and community, we give thanks. Another Christmas is over. I hope it was a good day for you, but I know that sometimes it is not always so merry a Christmas. I'm thinking of two of my neighbours in my village. For one, this is her first Christmas without her husband, and for another who three days ago fell and broke her leg is now in the sand hospital where they have just reimposed a ban on visitors. Meanwhile, their daughter had to find respite for her father, who has Parkinson's. I didn't grow up in a religious home. My mother had been raised a Catholic, but was not practicing, and my father was a committed Freemason. Dad wanted my brother and me to join the Masons, but neither of us were interested at all. Anyway, neither of us were baptized. I was baptised after I came to faith as a teenager with the rite from the Book of Common Prayer entitled Baptism for Those of Riper Years and Can Answer for Themselves. Of course, we observed Christmas in a secular way with tree, presents, cake, chicken for lunch, a treat in the 1940s. I think I was 17 before I first tasted turkey and we enjoyed the Christmas carol, but we didn't go to church. Did we observe Advent? Well, yes, in a sort of a way. There was the end of the school year. There was getting a tree from the bush and decorating it. There were Christmas at Beatles, the nativity scene in the window of David Jones, and of course, visiting Santa. The real Santa was the one at Anthony Horden's store. He was very fat. I had noticed other skinny Santas, which my mother told me were the helpers for the real Santa. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we learn to deceive. I actually was Santa on one occasion. This was at a Christmas party for a wide circle of friends and lots of children. The hosts lived on a large property, the only house on the road which ran off New Line Road, West Bennett Hills. The plan was that someone would drop me off at the end of the road. I would walk up with a bag of goodies, ho-hoing and ringing my bell, and after sowing the seeds of materialism in the minds of these children, I'd wander off down the road. After a short interval, my good wife Ruth would discreetly slip down in our car and I would disrobe and return to the party. An hour later, I was still waiting. Finally, I had to flag down a passing motorist to go to the party and tell them about the poor old Santa waiting to be rescued. 
Ruth, who had completely forgotten, was happily chatting to her friends, felt this was more amusing than I did. I divert. Like all young children, I was drawn into the Christmas story. There's magic and mystery, shepherds, angels, wise men, strange star, a strange star, the birth of a child in a stable. These are the stories a young child will readily believe. We connect our own stories to the Christmas story, don't we? When some significant event in our personal community life happens around the Christmas period, it makes a special connection. Christmas can have a power to make us, help us make sense of things. A young ch couple I saw on the train with a little child would have been that little boy's first Christmas. It's a little thing. Is this, uh, uh, is this, is this a little of what incarnation is about? Maybe. Think of the Christmas tr Eve truce in 1914 when British and German soldiers sang carols and exchanged gifts. We are getting into the power of stories. Did you see Christmas in Australia this week, presented by Christine Anu? She brought together stories from many cultural perspectives and particularly her own Torres Strait Islander heritage. For me, the most touching moment was when Christine and her daughter sang Silent Night in language via Zoom to Christine's mother in the Torres Strait. And that's a story with a few layers. Over the last weeks, our Advent story, over the last weeks on our Advent journey, we've immersed ourselves into story, prophecies from the past recalled, strange visits from a heavenly messenger, unexpected pregnancies, the parallel birth narratives of John and Jesus. We have this year been following the story as Luke tells it. There's also a Matthew version, which I guess you know, they don't match very well. Our Christmas cards and pageants bless, blend, blend them, but they don't, can't, can't both be right. It's not just a star, an undefined number of wise men in one, and a cry of angels and shepherds in the other. And note that donkeys and oxen don't get, a Guern, get, don't get a Guernsey in either. Two major bits that don't match up are firstly, that in Matthew, Bethlehem was a home of Mary and Joseph at the time of Jesus' birth, whereas in Luke, their home is in Nazareth, and they came to Bethlehem only because of the census. Secondly, in Matthew, the story becomes very really dark, with Herod seeking to kill Jesus, the family seeking refuge in Egypt, and then the murder of the young children in Bethlehem. But in Luke, the family follows the usual rituals of circumcision and purification. The child is affirmed by Anna and Simeon, and they return peacefully to the home in Nazareth. Two stories, they can't both be right, or can they? Do we have to choose between fact and fable? Our post-enlightenment thinking has given us a mindset that something is only true if it is factually correct. It must be factual to be true. If not factual, it is fable, fairy story of no value, lacking in truth. Marcus Borg and Dominic Crossan, in their book, The First Christ Christmas, argue that there's a third way, and that is that both these stories can be understood as parable. The truth is in the meaning of the parable. We all know, don't we, that the truth of Jesus' parables, such as the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son, does not lie in whether there was an actual son or an actual Samaritan. That is irrelevant for the truth of these stories. Bargain Cross, Borg and Crossan go on to argue that each birth story has an overture, is an overture 
to the gospel that follows. We're used to the idea of overture in the field of music, being the instrumental introduction to a ballet, opera, or oratorio. Borg and Crossan explain what they mean by referring to the first chapter of Barbara Tuxman's book, The Guns of August. This book, published in 1962, describes the negotiations between the great powers that led to the outbreak of World War I. Her thesis is that bungled diplomacy caused the war. The first chapter describes a funeral of King Edward VII in 1910. This is the last time that all the crowned heads of Europe met together. By the end of the decade, the Great War had torn apart that political fabric and the empires and kingdoms represented at that funeral had vanished or been changed beyond recognition. This chapter is the overture to the body of the book. So if we apply this idea of parable and overture to the birth narratives, then we may be back on the right track to find the truth of each. In Matthew's birth narrative, we see parallels to stories in the Hebrew scriptures. There's the birth of Jesus and the birth of Moses. There are evil rulers, Pharaoh and Herod, who do not hesitate to kill children when their power is threatened. There are two Josephs, one who has, who, both who have dreams and visions. There's an emphasis in Matthew on the fulfillment of prophecy. In the body of the gospel, Jesus is the new lawgiver, the fulfillment of Moses. Then there's a the symbolism of the gifts of the Magi, gold for kingship, frankincense for worship, myrrh for burial. These gifts represent key elements in the story Matthew will tell. In Luke's birth narrative, there are three themes which are played out in the body of the gospel. An emphasis on women, an emphasis on the marginalized, and the power and role of the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of John has no birth narrative, but has its own form of overture we call the prologue, in which John describes the pre-existence of the Christ, the Word, signalling that this Gospel will explore the divinity of Christ, which we see most clearly in the I Am claims of Jesus. Mark jumps in, boosts and all, the beginning of the good news of Jesus, Christ the Son of God. So what of our story today? The boy Jesus, aged 12 in the temple. Why has Luke included this material? Is this simply a pleasant little story with no particular significance? Or are there links with the birth narratives and the body of the gospel? And of course we see echoes of the story of Samuel in this story too. My first response when thinking about this story is that it reflects something about the home life of Jesus. Obviously, this was a faithful and devout Jewish family. They followed all the laws and would have passed this on to Jesus' sisters and brothers. I'm sure that for most of us, our values are given shape by our childhood family life. There may be things we have absorbed into ourselves. Some we have come to question and some we have turned away from or rejected. As I said, my upbringing was a non-religious one, but we're always taught to respect difference, whether it was racial or religious. We were taught by word and example not to hold prejudice. My mother, who had lost a brother at Gallipoli, gave us a strong commitment to pacifism. My brother, seven years my senior, and whose atheism I came to reject, was as left-wing as he could be in the late 40s and early 50s, and he reinforced a desire for social justice. When I came to faith in my teens, I already had a lens for what I was looking at in the church. While I came to faith within the evangelical Sydney Anglicanism, I needed to move beyond that, which I did when I discovered the Student Christian Movement, SCM, at Sydney University. I also discovered Ruth there. It has been said that SCM also stood for students contemplating marriage. I was at home 
with the progressive thinking and commitment to peace and social justice. I also found this in the congregational church, which I joined when we married. Women were affirmed and the church governance was democratic. Jesus in the temple story is age 12. He is, in the cusp, he is on the cusp of becoming an adult within the life of the synagogue. So this is to some extent a coming of age story. His family have been doing this annual pilgrimage every year, but now Jesus is taking an interest. He stays behind. The family don't miss him for a day, no doubt because there would have been a crowd of family and friends from Nazareth also in the party. Now they can't find him, and they hunt the back streets of Jerusalem, looking in places where a child might have been abducted or harmed. In these situations, we always think the worst, don't we? Or perhaps Mary would be thinking of the strange prophecy of Simeon 12 years earlier about the destiny of this child, but also that a sword will pierce your own soul too. Then, after three days of agony, there he is, impressing the learned men of the temple with his knowledge and questions. His parents, however, are not impressed. How can you do this? He replies, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? These are the first words spoken by Jesus recorded in any of the Gospels. I must be in my father's house. This is where the boy feels he must be. Why can't his parents see this? But they do not understand his answer. This will not be the last time Jesus mis is misunderstood by those close to him. Nevertheless, just as it was when the shepherds gave the angel's message to Mary and Joseph, his mother treasured all these things in her heart. In Jesus' coming of age, he is sensing where he belongs. He perhaps has a growing understanding of his relationship with God. And just as it was when he was first taken to Nazareth, Jesus increased in wisdom, in years, and in divine and human favour. As I see it, the story of the boy Jesus in the temple is not a standalone story. It's part of Luke's overture to the main body of the gospel, as we can see by the links with the birth narrative. It also foreshadows what lies ahead. The age of 12 links with the raising of Jairus' 12-year-old daughter and the healing of a woman who had bled for 12 years. His parents search for three days and Jesus' death and resurrection cover a period of three days. Jesus' understanding of his special relationship with God will later lead him to confront the religious leaders and teachers at whose feet he had once stood. He will denounce the hypocrisy and their oppression of the poor and set himself on a collision course with religious and secular power. It is written, my house should be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. If the birth narratives can be thought of as overtures to the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, then these Gospels, along with Mark and John, might be seen as overtures to the lives of the many who over the centuries have followed Jesus, the ongoing life, witness and struggle of the church. Saint Stephen, whose feast day is today, is an example of this witness and struggle. Our second reading today tells of the martyrdom of Stephen. Now, if Stephen had stayed on task, he might have saved himself a lot of grief. Stephen, along with six other worthy people, were chosen to be part, um, were chosen to be, sorry, Stephen, along with six other worthy people, were chosen to sort out bun fights, literally, between the Hellenists and Hebrews over the distribution of food to the widows of their communities. The disciples had decided that it is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to serve at tables. It is not right 
that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait at tables. Hmm, make of that what you will. So the seven chosen were the first to be ordained into a ministry of service, a diaconal ministry. Five of the seven are not mentioned again in the New Testament. We hear more of only two. Stephen is caught up in the early persecution of the church, confronting the religious power brokers, and is murdered for his loyalty to Christ and for speaking the truth. Philip goes beyond Jerusalem to take the good news to Samaria and beyond. My call to ordained ministry came at the Sixth Assembly of the Uniting Church in 1991, where I was present as an observer, and when the decision was taken to renew the diaconate. The visions for a ministry already be undertaken by deaconesses of service in the community and with a strong emphasis on social justice. We need to be waiting on tables by feeding the hungry and finding shelter for the homeless. But we need to be asking why people are hungry and homeless. What are the structures in society that cause inequality and injustice? How do we change them? Like Stephen, what risks are we prepared to take? They can start with small steps. A final story. When I was in ministry at Campsey Earlwood Clempton Park, in partnership with Marta Havea Helau, who is now our moderator-elect, we started an after-school youth group. One afternoon, Christine, who was of Tongan background, came to youth group wearing a headscarf. When asked about this, she explained that her friend at Canterbury High School, Canterbury Girls High School, was being teased by other girls because of her hijab. So Christine put on a headscarf in solidarity. I said to Martha, we're getting somewhere with these kids. Amen.